We should have made Ukraine too bitter a pill rather than sort of flirting with the idea of NATO enraging Putin, enraging the Kremlin and giving him an excuse. He might well have moved anyway. Sasha Havlicek, our fault. Well, this is the thing. I think we have made a number of mistakes, but I don't think those are the mistakes. Um, Putin has repeatedly tested Western resolve um, to see how far he could go the next time round from the invasion of Georgia to Crimea, of course. Uh, this war in Ukraine isn't actually new. To the war in Syria, where he perpetrated war crimes that went entirely unanswered by the international community. Those red lines that have been crossed and crossed again. We had opportunities uh, to push back, to start with sanctions earlier on that would have degraded his capabilities to get further and further and further. We had opportunities to start to really have an impact on his propaganda machinery domestically, globally. We haven't done that until now. We've only just started to have um, measures taken in, in that regard. So we've made a lot of mistakes and it isn't so un unbelievable that Putin would assume that there would be very little pushback from NATO, from, uh, from the EU, from the transatlantic alliance, because there hasn't been to date. So what I would say is, um, we need to have the resolve now. And I do think that we're seeing some really quite seismic changes in, in response. We've seen the EU come to the table, offer uh, mm. weaponry in record time. We've seen a complete 180 degree turnaround in German foreign policy. They're investing in their military. Yeah, They're the Germans are going to put 100 billion, I think. Huge, 100 yeah. billion. And this is a massive departure in terms of their own uh, foreign policy uh, since the, the end of the, the war, the Second World War. We are starting, we, we see the EU now offer Ukraine membership of the EU, start to use enlargement as an actual tool of influence again mm. in the neighborhood. So there's, there are some seeds for hope okay. if we can sustain it. Now, that's the okay. other question. Well, we'll come, we'll come to that. Alistair Burt, um, this was never your own specific territory, but you were in the Foreign Office for quite a long time. Yeah. <clears throat> we may be doing the right thing now, but five years too late. Um, I think there's a lot of analysis that can be done about... Welcome back to the great debate. Can the West stop Vladimir Putin? The images played around the world of the Ukraine invasion often show horribly familiar scenes. Men conscripted to fight, tanks rolling in and gunfire and shelling hitting towns and cities. But this war is being fought on another front too. The information battle is raging online as both sides tell their own version of events. Clive Eshelman, uh, you're in Accra. I think you're watching this and you've got a view about the information war. Clive. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I like the point that Sasha raised about her dialogue. My question is, who is controlling the propaganda about the Russian invasion and what is the end game? Thank you, Clive. So Clive's uh, got a straightforward question for our panel who is controlling propaganda about the russian invasion and what is the end game sasha what do you think uh, the russians have seen information as a central pillar of their domestic and foreign policy for always and they've invested really heavily in building out an infrastructure for information operations around the world that combines uh, effective state media which is essentially an extension of the Kremlin's uh, foreign policy arsenal. So RT is putting, it combines that with all sorts, a massive network of pro-Kremlin influencers around the world. And then all the, co the covert tactics that we came to associate in 2016 with Brexit and the US presidential elections in the West, because this has been going on, of course, in Russia's sphere of influence for much, much, much longer. But the bot nets, the cyborg nets, the troll farms, and, and of course, all the hacking that we've seen. And that, that power, um, it, you ask the end game. The end game is really to undermine um, liberal, the, the liberal world order. And, and the liberal democracies that underpin it. It is to undermine the very concept of truth and a shared reality. And in the context of this war, it has laid the foundations 
for a domestic audience and for a Russian audience in Ukraine and elsewhere. Domestic um, audience in Russia, you mean? In Russia, for, um, for this conflict, um, providing reasons for this conflict, telling the people that this is about saving the people of Ukraine from a Nazi regime, um, saving them, saving Russians from attack within the country. Let me, um, let's go, let's go to Tanya. Tanya, you're in Hertfordshire. Um, speak to Hello. us about your experience and your family, I think. Hello, yes. I, I've been living in the UK for 20 years, but my dad and my family is still in Russia, in Siberia. And um, 